Hey there, Pathfinders. Welcome to the Pathfinders podcast. My name is Tam Ko. I am your host. And in every episode, I interview really interesting people with uncommon careers and life journey so that if you're deciding on a career or you're looking for some inspiration, you can learn from people who have experience paving their own path in life. Today, we have Kim Kofino. Hi. Welcome to the podcast. Can you introduce what you're doing quickly in a few sentences? Sure. For most of my career, I was a teacher, and now I've transitioned to owning my own company where we train teachers. And you have more than one company, right? Yes. So one company focuses on training teachers and writing books and online courses and events. And then another company is very specifically just a certain online course. And then another organization is a nonprofit that runs conferences. So three of them all together. Yes. Wow. But then all of them are pretty much in the same field of educating educators. Exactly. Which I think is really interesting because I've never heard of this job before I met you. Crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Like I didn't know that someone is training educators. I think they need a lot of help, especially transitioning into a new way of teaching. And you try to incorporate a lot of technology Yeah. So our focus is helping teachers understand how to use digital technologies to transform learning. So really looking at the ways that we can capitalize on all the different exciting innovations in technology and making the classroom a really engaging and empowering place for students. So for many teachers, they didn't get that education when they were going to university. So this is all really new to them. And often they're in a situation where every student in the room has access to a laptop or even just a mobile phone. And then suddenly, you know, what do I do with this? So that's where we come in. You also train parents as well, right? One of your articles on the website is like, my kid is playing Minecraft. What do I do with it? Yes. <laughs> and I think it's really great that you help parents understand that it's not just something useless or a waste of time for kids, but they actually learn something with it. For example, yes. Minecraft is pretty much like Lego, but in the digital world. And you use a lot of creativity, crafting whatever you want in that world. Exactly. Very well said. And I think parents really struggle because they're not used to the ways that we interact in digital media. And so they kind of assume that kids are wasting time, but actually they're learning a lot, even through social media, or it can be through games like Minecraft, or it can be through the different ways that they interact with people in digital spaces. Can you introduce yourself as a person? And do you have any values that guide you in life? I would say I am a type A person, so I like things to be very orderly and I'm very organized. I'm very focused and driven. Having said all of that, I still love to have fun. I feel like I laugh all the time and I want to enjoy the fun side of life and not just work hard, but I'm really motivated to do the best at what I can do. I tend to be rather black and white. Things are right or they're wrong and I struggle to see the gray area. My idea of fairness is really a big part of who I am. That idea of equality and I want everyone's voice to be heard in an organization as well as for my students and making sure that everyone has access to what they need. And in my personal career, that's education, access to technology and access to all of the things that potentially the internet and technology can give us. I really want to level up society by providing people with fair access to what they need. And I love learning. So like that idea of equality and fairness, voice and empowerment and learning all really comes together really nicely. You merge all these things that you like for yourself and now you're doing something that you really love doing. And I think that comes from being really passionate about those things, but it also comes from relentless persistence. Let's get into how you got into this path. When you were younger, did you like school? That is such a good question. I would say generally I liked school and I was a good student and I learned the way my teachers taught. So very often people who go into teaching are really good at auditory learning. So I learned really well when people spoke to me, but I never thought I wanted to be a teacher. I always thought I didn't like children. It turns out I actually love kids, but I just didn't know it when I was younger. You're from America. Yes. And you studied in America, basically. Yes. The last interview that I had with a professor, he was from Germany, and I asked him what's education like there. So I want to ask you, what do you think of education in the U.S.? 
When I went to school, it was very much lecture. The kid just sits in the room and the teacher just shares information to them. I think today that trend is really changing and we're understanding that people learn in lots of different ways. You need to provide many different learning experiences for students, particularly in elementary, middle school and high school. University, I think, is still primarily lecture driven. And I think it does probably depend a lot on which university you go to. I can tell you about the ones that I went to. I went to the University of Connecticut, which is my home state, which is in the Northeast of the United States. It was very lecture driven. I was a history and political science major, so most of my classes were quite large. So freshman classes are 100, 200, 300 people. But then when you get into the smaller group classes, maybe 20 to 30 people, and the professor usually lectures and you take notes, and then your exam is usually handwritten. So... I went to university and I did my degree in history and political science because I wanted to be a human rights lawyer. And I did my internship in human rights organizations in Washington, D.C. and realized I didn't want to be a lawyer. I didn't want to go back to school. It just wasn't calling to me the way I wanted it to. And what happened, I guess maybe a big transition was I did a study abroad when I was in university and I realized I wanted to live overseas. And I thought maybe I could do human rights law from another country. And then I just over time realized how hard that would be and said, this is not going to work out for me. Hard in what sense? The subject itself or the way of living that you want? I think the first thing was I didn't want to take another entrance exam to go to university. So I didn't want to take the GREs to be able to go to law school. Then on top of that, I didn't realize the language barriers. Like I did my study abroad in Italy and everyone speaks Italian. And so it was really great that I learned Italian when I lived there. But then thinking about living overseas and having to operate in a host country language and not knowing which country or which language, it just started to like snowball into being super overwhelming. So after I graduated, I said, okay, I'm going to take a break from this. I'm going to do something else and see if I can figure out what I want to do. I moved in with Alex, who's now my husband, but at the time was just my boyfriend and got a job managing property. The whole building was owned by the company, and I was the manager for that building. You help the residents with whatever they need. So I did that for one year. Was that like a random job? Completely random. How did you first get that job? When we moved into our apartment building, the woman who was the property manager in that building asked me if I had any work. And I said, no. And she said, you would make a great property manager. Do you want to work for my company? And I was like, okay. So I was, you know, 21. I didn't really know what was going to happen. That's fine to do that for a year. And then during that year, we went and visited a friend of mine who was living in Germany at the time. And she was doing her internship at Munich International School in the computer science department. Myself and Alex both were like, how soon can we go and live in another country? We had both done study abroad and we loved it. And we knew we wanted to be overseas again. We just didn't know how we were going to get there. And then seeing my friend do this job that she didn't really need a lot of training for because she was just an intern. We were like, that's it. That's what we're going to do. What made you interested in living in a different country long term? That's very different from an exchange program abroad. Even growing up, I was always very interested in travel. My family does not travel a lot. They almost never leave the area of the United States they live in. The farthest place they go is my aunt's house, which is like three hours away. My first time on a plane might have been when I did my study abroad in Italy. I just kind of felt like the world is out there and I wanted to be part of it. And so part of the wanting to be a human rights lawyer, that's a way that I thought I could live in another country. I just didn't know what the opportunities were available to me. So that's why when we went and visited my friend and saw that she was doing that internship, I thought, oh, this is something I can do and this can get us to live in another country. So I thought I could just do the same thing as her. So I followed the same exact process that she did. And it turns out that the company that she went through was not interested in me. And they were very clear and firm and said, you don't meet our needs. We are not going to find a job for you. International schools generally tend to be kind of exclusive. They want to hire teachers who have significant experience. They want to hire teachers that are really well recommended from other international schools. And they want to make sure that when they fly someone over and pay for their apartment, that person is going to work out. For me, I had no teaching experience. I didn't even have a teaching degree. I had nothing. I was just a college graduate. And I wasn't coming from an Ivy League school like my friend that I went to visit. She came from an Ivy League school. And there's a perception in the United States and in many countries 
that if you're a graduate of an Ivy League school, you are better than graduates of other universities, which I don't think is true. (laughs) So just leave it at that. So they basically felt like I did not have anything to offer. I thought that was very unfair. In fact, I really did not like the way they treated me. The guy who wrote back to me was actually quite rude. And so I actually wrote to my friend again and said, you know, I want to do what you're doing, but the company that you use doesn't want me. What do I do? And she's like, oh, just write to the head of school directly. So I did. I wrote to the head of school directly. I got an interview. And within like a week, I had the job, the job that they told me I could never get. The last guest, he said, never apply for a job. Just contact the heads of the company directly. Yeah. And now is another evidence that that actually works. I think if you really know what you want and you feel like you're a good fit, sometimes you have to like pitch that to the employer and help them understand why you're the right person for that job. Because sometimes if there's someone in between and you don't tick all their boxes, they won't even pay any attention to you. But then how did you interview for that job that you didn't have experience for? One of the things that got me the job is in my cover letter, I said something about growing up in an IBM family. So my mom and my dad and my stepfather, because my parents are divorced, all worked for IBM, a famous computer company that was much bigger in the 80s and 90s than it is today. Whatever the way that I describe growing up in this family, it really stood out to the head of school. And that's why he wanted to interview me. When I left the school five years later, he referenced my cover letter again in my departure speech. My tone, my energy, whatever it was, must have really kind of jumped out at him. And he knew I didn't have any teaching experience. I didn't lie. This job was for an intern job. Basically, the idea is just to kind of monitor the computer lab. It wasn't anything that really required teaching experience. Did your husband do the same thing? Because you're moving together. Right. My husband did not try to do that. He just came with me. And he was not my husband at the time. They asked me if I was bringing anyone with me. And I said no, which was a total lie. The reason why they ask is someone coming with you is because it's hard. You need a work visa. You need an apartment for two people. The housing allowance that they give you is just for one person. All of these things you don't think about when you're only 21 years old. That's why they ask. It's not to penalize you. It's to help you. But I was so worried that if I said that my boyfriend was coming, they wouldn't offer me the job. They totally knew I had a boyfriend. They just didn't push me on it because I'm sure that must happen all the time. Then we went to Germany and I was there for a year and loved it and decided I wanted to be a teacher. At what point did you realize that you liked teaching? Very quickly. I was based in the computer lab. And so I had to make sure that the computer teacher had all the support that he needed. Restart a computer or to go make some photocopies, like that kind of stuff. And basically after like a month of being in the computer lab and watching the computer classes, I thought, oh, I could do this in a really fun way, in a way that kids would really enjoy coming to this class. And I know that the computer teacher really likes teaching math more than he likes teaching computers. So he would be really happy if I took over the computer part because I was kind of friends with him and talked to him about it. And so after three months, I wrote a proposal to my principal and said, I'd like to get my teaching degree. If you would help me, I would like to stay here and teach the computer classes. And then any amount of time that isn't teaching time, I would continue to be an intern. My principal was awesome and he really supported me. So that school actually subsidized my master's degree that I got in education. Took me three years to do that and my parents helped me with the other part of it. So then I stayed there for five years and I got my teaching degree and I helped develop their technology integration program. What is the technology integration program? So basically in the early 2000s at this school is when I started. And at that time they had like computer class. So the kids would come and they would learn how to use Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel or those kinds of things. At that time, education was going through like a little bit of a shift and people were realizing that it's not really good to learn skills just in case you need them. You need to learn the skills when you're actually using them. So you're in math class and you need to make a graph. That's when you should learn how to use Excel. And that's when you should learn how to use the charts feature. Or you're in humanities, which is like social studies, and you have to make a presentation. Well, that's when you should learn how to use PowerPoint. Not two months before you learn how to use a PowerPoint. And then two months later, you have to go to your social studies class and remember all your skills. That's just not kind of the way our brains work. So as a school, I kind of led the shift from separate technology classes to this idea of technology integration. So that means instead of teaching computer classes, I would go into the science classroom and I would find out what they were doing in science and help them find the technology tool that best allowed students to demonstrate their understanding in science using technology. 
and making sure that the content of the class that is being taught, science, math, English, whatever, is the most important thing. But technology is a way that we can use to help students demonstrate their understanding or access content or information in different ways or even connect kind of their learning with other pieces of what they know. That's amazing because a lot of schools teach theories and students don't know why we're learning this or where they're going to use them. But with this kind of curriculum, then they understand, okay, this can help me do this right away. Exactly. It took five years for me to like understand how that works. And I did a lot of training and I went to a lot of conferences and talked to a lot of people and started like reading books and reading online and figuring out how this might work. Over that time, I went from being like 50% separate technology classroom teacher because that's how it started and 50% intern to finally being full-time. I think my title was academic technology coordinator or something like that when I left that school. Was it a completely new position that you created for yourself? Yes. I like that you and a few more people that I interviewed before basically created an opportunity for yourself from just seeing what needs to be done and that you want to do it. And then you can go and propose the head of the company, something that they obviously already need. I think a lot of people like me growing up, I didn't realize that you can do something like that. There are these positions available and you are only allowed to apply for each of these. Right. That's the mindset of myself in the past and a lot of people. I don't know why I have that mindset. I don't know if it's partly an American kind of mentality that I'm number one and that kind of attitude that I can do anything. Or if I am just like super type A and logical and I'm like, oh, this is missing. I guess I'm persistent and resilient. Because when people tell me no, I usually figure out another way to do it. (laughs) Did you have an interest or passion in technology in the first place? Or did you just see, okay, this is an opportunity that needs to be done, so I'm going to go do it? Mostly that. When I applied for the job being the computer intern, it was because that's what my friend did. It wasn't because I had any special passion in education. It wasn't because I had any special passion in technology. I always felt comfortable around technology, but I never thought that would be something I would do as a career. And I think just seeing that teacher in action and seeing the kids and seeing how much fun they had all the time just really inspired me. And I wanted to do that. So you stayed at that school for five years? Yes. What made you decide to leave and do something else? Another really good question. As a foreigner living in other countries, one of the things that we are often bound by are governmental restrictions. And in this case, in Germany, there were two really important ones. One was if you stay less than two years, you could get all your German taxes back because it was a lot of money because taxes are high in Germany. The other one was five years. If you stay less than five years, you can get all your social security money back. And that was less money than the taxes, but it was still a significant amount of money. And then when it came up to five years, at that time, Alex was my husband and we just thought, let's go and try another adventure and see what that's like. Then we went to Malaysia and we lived in Malaysia for two years. Was it another random decision? Yes. Before we moved, we had been hearing about Dubai because 2005 in Germany, Dubai was like a really trendy place to go on vacation. So we heard all this about Dubai. We're like, we're going to go to Dubai. That sounds amazing. They have the beach. It's like a holiday destination. That's where we're going to live. So we actually took a trip to Dubai and I interviewed with nine different schools. I got offers at all the schools I interviewed with. But then we didn't want to make a decision right away. So we went to a job fair, which is very common for international school teachers. And at that job fair, just totally random, there was one school and the picture of the school was like in a jungle and the school looked so beautiful and the head of school was so nice in the interview and the job just sounded so perfect. And we went back to the hotel room and I asked Alex, my husband, I said, what do you think? Do you want to go to the desert? Or do you want to go to the jungle? And he was like, the jungle sounds so much more interesting. And we're like, okay. Were you looking for the same type of position? Because as we mentioned, you pretty much created your own position, right? Yes. Then it wouldn't exist in other schools? So different schools had different structures. But at this time, I would say the idea of like a technology facilitator was becoming more popular. So the job I applied for was probably a technology teacher. While I was there in the first year, I helped them develop a technology integration program, very similar to what I did in Munich. Did you ever have to really convince them that they need this? Or was it something that they realized that, okay, we need this and it's perfect that someone's doing this? 
at every job I've been in, I've had to convince somebody that they really needed something. (laughs) Whether it was a technology coach or facilitator position or one-to-one laptops for students or professional development for teachers. At every job I've ever been in, I've been a strong advocate for technology for learning because in that very first job, I realized how critical it was for students today to feel like they know how to use technology when they need to use technology. And so that shaped everything that I did after that. Can you share how you convinced them? Especially schools in Asia is quite bureaucratic and they have all these structures and these fixed curriculum. International schools would be very different than public schools. Every international school is its own organization and they would have a head of school and that person is like the top. They have maybe a board of directors and that's usually made up of parents who help make decisions for the school and they hire and fire the head of school. But really the only person you need to talk to is the head of school. So there's not government telling them what to do or what they can't do, which is what makes public school really challenging. Because when you have governmental involvement, it's just so many more bureaucrats, right? So how do I do that? At this point in my career, I would base a lot on experience. I would say, having been to this many schools and seen this many things, this is what's right for your school, given this particular situation. At the beginning of my career, it was more like, I see this hole here. Something's missing. I would be really excited to try and help you fill that gap. And this is why I think I would be really good at that thing, because I have these qualities or these interests or maybe these experiences that may not be directly related to the thing I wanted to do, but generally related. So how different is it working in Malaysia and in Germany? Because it's international schools, they're pretty similar. And many international schools follow a very similar curriculum. There are three big types of international schools an American style curriculum, a British style curriculum, and there's ones that follow an international style curriculum. Those are probably the ones that most English speaking teachers would go to. And the one that I like is called the International Baccalaureate. I tend to go to schools that follow that curriculum, which means even though they're in different countries, the actual school is very similar. It's easier to understand the structures and what they need. Yes. What I really like about the schools that I work in is they're very holistic. They look at the student as a whole person. They look at curriculum in context where we are learning many different subjects through a unit of inquiry, for example. So a unit of inquiry would be a concept-driven unit of study where students are learning about a bigger idea. So maybe they're learning about conflict. We might look at data from different conflicts around the world. And then we might use our math skills to understand that data and demonstrate that data. And we might also look at why does conflict occur? It might have something to do with availability of resources or the safety of the population. And so then we might use some of our science or our humanities skills to analyze those things and come to some conclusions. And then we might need to share this information with an authentic audience. So we're going to use our English, our grammar skills, our language skills, our communication skills to present that information. So the concept would be conflict but we're using all of our different subject areas to really access that. Let's continue from Malaysia. So we were there for two years. The director of the school that hired us was leaving, and we really liked him. So we didn't really want to stay without him being there. And it just so happened that a job came up at International School Bangkok, and it was a unique job in that they were looking for somebody who was very passionate about technology and had experience using technology in the classroom, like that technology coach job, but someone who was also interested in bringing that element to the library. Because lots of times schools can be kind of innovative, but the library can be this like really quiet place that doesn't really change very much. So I thought that sounded like the perfect opportunity because I love reading. I love libraries. And of course, the idea of living in Bangkok sounded great because we had been there for vacation and it was close and we knew about it. We went for a job interview and I got the job offer. So we were able to resign from Malaysia and we moved to Thailand. And that job was one challenging position because it was a job that no one had ever heard of. My title was called 21st Century Literacy Specialist. Basically, I was doing a technology coach job, the same job that I had done in other schools. But now I was kind of physically seated in the library and there was the general expectation from the teachers who would come in that I was a librarian, which was really challenging because I was not a librarian. 
I did that job for two years. And then in my third year, I moved up to middle school technology coach, which was the job I've always done. And I really loved and felt much more comfortable doing that job. So we had been like five years in Southeast Asia, where you feel like you really kind of understand a place. You are ready to try something new. One of the issues was at that school, the middle school position was only part-time. And I really wanted to be full-time middle school budget constraints. I don't remember. There was an issue there. And so I just looked for another job because I didn't want to stay in a job that I didn't want to be in. And I found a school in Japan. First of all, my husband and I knew the next place we wanted to live was Japan. We went there for vacation. We loved it. We really wanted to live in Japan. It just so happened when we went for vacation, we set up some visits at international schools. So we visited like four schools, I think, that we thought we might want to work at. And when we were there, we interviewed with the heads of schools so we could see if it was a place we would want to work. One of the schools hired me to come and do a workshop with their teachers. Leading up to that workshop, I was in contact with the head of school, the person that had interviewed me the year before, and said, you know, we're ready to move. We want to move to Japan. Do you have positions at the school for us? And they offered us jobs. To clarify, your husband does the exact same work that you do? Good question. So while we were living in Thailand... Alex thought that he might keep doing like the copy editing and the freelance writing and that kind of stuff, but he got really lonely, like just being in the apartment by himself. So he decided he wanted to become a teacher too. So while we were here, he did his teacher's training and he started working at the American School of Bangkok. By the end of our time in Bangkok, yes, we were both doing the same thing. So then we moved to Japan and I was a technology coach there as well. And that school had access to laptops in carts. The teachers would book the laptops and then wheel them into the classroom and use them. Interesting. Yeah. That's, so that's what we, you do at schools when you don't have access to technology and you're not ready to like have the kids bring their own computers. So you provide them on carts. It's like so normal in international schools. So at this school in Japan, which is Yokohama International School, when I came in and saw what was going on, I said, okay, your next step is to give each kid a laptop and start a one-to-one program. Like this is what's expected now in international schools. So while I was there, I developed their one-to-one program with all sorts of other people. And that was fabulous and a great learning opportunity. And I loved working there. Again, it was only because we had been there for five years and it was just kind of that like, it's time to try something new that we left. We moved to Bangkok again. And one of the reasons was because I was getting so much work doing workshops at other schools and doing so much traveling that I couldn't do both things. I couldn't be a full-time teacher and build my own business. It was too much. If I was going to run my own company from my own house, I wanted to be somewhere where, first of all, I could have more physical space because Japan apartments are really small, where the weather is better because it gets really cold in the winter in Japan. And where there was more opportunity to connect with other people, whereas Japan is a bit of a closed environment. When do you start building your own business? You can be a consultant and not have like a business. You can just go and do workshops and go to schools and give them advice. So I started doing that when I was living in Bangkok the first time. And then I just got better and better at it because I had more and more experience while I was living in Japan. One of the businesses was started here in Bangkok. That one's called Cotail. It's the Certificate of Educational Technology and Information Literacy. And it's a postgraduate five-course certification program for teachers to help become more confident in their use of technology in the classroom. So that was started with one of my colleagues that worked at ISB at the time. So we were running that company and he was living in Bangkok and I was living in Japan. And then he moved to Seattle, which is where he's from. And it was really successful and we really enjoyed it. And I was doing my own consulting and my business partner, Jeff, was doing his own consulting. And we realized that if we worked together, we could help more people. We did a lot of the same kinds of work, but he had really strong areas that I was weak in and I had really strong areas that he was weak in. So we thought, let's start a new company. We don't want to mess with this one because neither of us have any business background. We were like amazed that it was working so well and we just didn't want to change anything. So instead of adding more people to Cotail, which we didn't know what would happen if we added more people, so we started a new company called Eduro Learning in 2013. We started the company with a team of seven people. 
But now because of different people's jobs and different people's travel and change, we're basically down to three directors of the company and then we have employees. Okay, let's explore this a little bit. When you come up with a micro-credential, as you called it, how do you make it legit? Because <laughs> anyone, any coach can come up with any course, right? But then to have an actual credential all of it, how do you make it more professional? So a couple of things. The first thing is we have a university in the United States that gives credit for those courses. So we have to share our syllabus, our like course outline with the university. And then the university says, yes, this is okay. We can offer this course. It's not easy. The first university that we worked with already had a special outreach office to support international school teachers overseas. I had done their educational leadership course when I was living in KL. So we knew this university. And so then we just contacted them and said, would you want to do this one too? And they were like, yes, that would be great for international school teachers. We'll do that. Was it difficult to get them to approve everything? Yeah. And because the university, there's a lot of bureaucracy and everything has to be exactly the way they want it in the format. In fact, it's probably the hardest part of everything, I would say. But it's important because people who want to take a micro-credential, they want to know that they can get university credit for it. I think the second thing that really helped us, what did you say, be legit, is because people know us, they know me and they know Jeff over many, many years of sharing our experience for free on our blogs. So we have legitimacy as being international school educators that know how to use technology in the classroom because we've been doing it for almost 20 years, being our own brand. I guess on top of that, you have to have an audience who wants what you're doing and likes it so much, they share it out again. So one of the things we did really well with Coattail is if you're going to do that micro-credential, you must blog about your experience throughout the whole program. So we have built in this public face of that micro-credential and that made it really successful. Does it work? Because if someone just started to create a blog, they might not necessarily share with people or have a lot of following. Yes. So definitely, I don't think every blog on our Coattail website is super popular. But we use Coattail as a hashtag on Twitter. We have our main website that shows all of the participant blogs. Everybody's blog has to be public. The final project that they do is a video. So that also has to be public. So people have like a window into the program before they take the program. They know exactly what they're going to get because they can see work of thousands of other teachers who have done the same program. Did you have business or marketing knowledge before starting a company? None. But then you know how to do this quite well, like using a hashtag and using a blog to promote. Because we are doing them for students to help students understand how they can use those tools to be better learners. So we were doing all of this as part of the work that we were doing every day and as part of our own professional growth. So as a teacher, I had a Twitter account long before I created Coattail and I understood hashtags and all that stuff. You mentioned that you and your partner, Jeff, has different strengths that complement each other. What are those different strengths? So Jeff is really great at selling, presenting information and being really personable and being like a magnetic personality that people want to be around. I'm really great at getting things done, keeping things organized, keeping people on task, making sure that the thoroughness is there. So he comes up with lots of awesome ideas and I kind of make them happen. And I think I come up with really good ideas too, but definitely I think we inspire each other in that sense. And then you said with Eduro, you started it with seven people, right? Yes. How did you choose these seven people? I know it's crazy. It's so crazy. We worked with people that we knew from either working in person at international schools or we had professional connections with in other ways. Everyone told us, do not start a company with seven people. It's crazy. It's too many people. And in retrospect, they were 100% correct. What are the things that you're doing right now with Eduro? We have these micro-credentials and Coattail now is just one of them. We have one for teachers who are new to the one-to-one -one classroom where every student in the classroom has a laptop. We have a micro-credential for a teacher who's really confident in using technology, but they want to get a global connection. So they want to start sharing their classroom with the world. So that one's called the Connected Teacher. And then we have one for teachers who want to be coaches. So they want to do the job that I used to do in schools. And then we have other online classes. We have conferences that we run. We do face-to-face -face consulting with schools where we go in and we train the teachers. And we have courses for parents. And we write books. 
We do a lot of things. We do too many things. When did you expand into teaching parents? has always been part of my job as a technology coach because parents really struggle with all the devices they have at home. What would you say is the different challenges of teaching students, teaching teachers, and parents? Teaching students is probably the easiest part. Students know how to be students. They are just there and ready to learn. Plus, I love kids. Kids are awesome. They're excited about learning. Their energy and their enthusiasm is just contagious. So I love being around kids. I love teaching adults, but a lot of times adults, as much as they want to learn, the older we get, the more set we get in our ways. And I am exactly the same. I'm not saying that I'm any different. So sometimes that rich open-mindedness that we see in students where they're just like a sponge ready to learn. As adults, you have to figure out what's the best way to help this person who's already really knowledgeable in their field understand something new and different that might be almost the exact opposite of what they've always done. I was actually thinking the opposite, but I don't have the teaching experience that you do. And I've only taught one university class so far. And I thought that teaching adults might be better because they basically sign up to learn. They have the goals. They're there because they want to be. Versus students, not all of them are there voluntarily. So you have half the class who are not very interested in not applying whatever you try to help them with. Yes, but I think that's the challenge for really good teachers is to figure out how to tap into their interests and their passions, how to engage them, how to get them interested in your subject area. And that's what I love teaching adults, how to help tap into the passions and interests of their students so that they can build a purpose for why they're learning what they're learning. My goal is always how to help whoever is in the room build their own understanding of whatever we're talking about. So I don't ever really want to tell someone something because I think it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. I want to help them go through some experiences where then they have this aha moment. They're like, oh, I see how that connects. And so trying to figure out how to help people have that moment is really interesting to me. And then working with parents is a whole completely different situation because as a parent, you only have your own children to go by and maybe your children's friends. You don't know what's normal. Everything that they do, you think, is what every child must do. So when we work with parents, we want to help them understand that we know exactly where they're coming from. We really understand the situation they're in. And because we've dealt with it so many different times, we have lots of different strategies that can support them with whatever the challenge might be. So when you work with parents, do you have to know their kids specifically? Generally speaking, usually the parent can articulate what's going on in the situation. And we can suggest, you know, this might work really well if your child prefers this kind of thing. It's easier, obviously, if you know the family, but it's not possible for us to know the family of every parent we work with. This is quite challenging because a lot of parents have never seen their students in a classroom or know their learning style. Yes, it's hard for parents to articulate and it's hard for children to articulate. I think that's a whole fascinating conversation because we talked a little earlier about how sometimes parents don't value what their kids are doing in digital spaces because they think they're just kind of like wasting time or playing games. However, having seen so much of that, I can see when kids are learning and I can ask the right questions that helps the child articulate their learning. And that's part of the art of being a really good teacher. And so as you become a better and better teacher with many years experience, you know the kinds of questions to ask. But again, because parents are only parents to the children that they have, they haven't had that years and years of experience of figuring out what exactly are the questions to ask? What exactly can we find out when we talk to our kids about what they're doing? And then how do we express that to somebody else when we need help? Because you have so many different programs and offerings now, when do you decide to expand into different areas? My nickname is More Work Kimbo because I'm always thinking of more work. Usually what will happen is I will go somewhere or I will have a conversation like this that inspires me to try something new. And then I'll come back to the team and say, what about if we offer this? And at the same time, Jeff has been somewhere and having something that inspires him. And he'll come back to the team and say, what about this? And at the same time, Chrissy is doing the same thing. So I think all three of us are kind of always interested in what else we can do. So the challenge is not coming up with new ideas. The challenge is saying, we already have enough things. Let's do these things really well. And that's very hard, especially for me. It's hard to manage that with just the three of you, right? So each time you expand into something new, do you have to hire more people? 
Oh, I wish we could keep hiring more people. <laughs> Usually we just do the work ourselves. We are really lucky that in the last year we've hired a part-time executive assistant, Raina, which is amazing. So she takes care of the bills and liaising with the university and kind of managing paperwork, helping us work with our consultants. Then we have our very first full-time employee who started on October 1st. Her name is Marissa and she's our marketing director. And then we have a team of consultants who do some of the face-to-face -face presenting at the school districts where we have long-term contracts with because very often those days are at the same time. So we'll have a contract in one school and then another one in another school on the same day. So we can't do that work. So you basically hire new people as you need? Yes. Definitely, because we can't afford to do anything more than that. And right now you're also flying to a lot of different places to work with different schools. Yes. How did that start? Like, how do you get connections in so many different countries? The same kind of thing with how I started doing all of this. When I moved from Malaysia to Bangkok, I attended some conferences and realized that I had something to offer. Like I went to presentations and saw what teachers were presenting and thought to myself, oh, this is a great idea and I'm doing this and I could share this thing and it fits in really well with this conference because of this. And so I started presenting at conferences and when you present at conferences, lots of people see you. They go back to their schools and say, oh, I saw Kim present. She should come to our school. So then I started getting all these interesting offers from schools for me to come and do like a workshop and that just scales out. So basically get yourself out there so that other people can see what you're doing. Absolutely. Presenting and writing my blog. Those are the two things that helped me build this business. You're going to do a podcast as well? Yeah. Aduro is going to do a podcast. We have a bunch of different ideas for our podcast. So it probably is going to be a couple podcasts over time. But we just recorded an episode last night. As a company, we have an advisory board. And these are teachers, parents, and students that we really respect living all over the world. We come together once a month and we have a conversation about education. And so last night we all had a conversation about like which social media tools are popular in your country and why do you think they're popular and what do they say about the culture and what are the skills we learn when we use social media? Why should schools and teachers and parents care about this? That sounds interesting. Yeah. What's the name of the podcast? Right now we're operating under the name Shifting Our Schools but it's going to split into streams. Shifting our schools is kind of the big picture one, and it's talking about how we can move our schools forward with technology. Then we'll have one that's just going to be the advisory board podcast, and we'll have one that's just our co-tail instructors, and we'll have one that's just talking to teachers. I'll yes. link it in the description. Awesome. Let's talk about your third company. So the last one is a nonprofit. It's called Learning2, and it is a conference that happens annually in Asia and in Europe. And it grew out of a conference that was supported by some regional organizations here for international schools and now has become its own nonprofit, which is really exciting because it's not just like a workshop that is kind of haphazardly run. It's a real actual organization, registered nonprofit in the United States. Are there other ventures that you want to expand into in the future? Gosh. Right now, I think this is all I can handle. What would be your long-term goals? I would like to continue working for myself. I love this opportunity to basically do whatever interests me and help push education forward. But I would like to be better at running a business to really grow into my job and my official title as chief operations officer. But honestly, owning my own company is like the top of my list of things that I never imagined I could do for myself. So I feel like I'm really happy and I hope I can continue doing this. What's the challenges of starting your own business? Mm, so many. I never would have thought that I could work for myself. Really? Yeah, never. Like I said before, my mom and my stepdad and my father all worked for IBM in their entire careers from when they started working to when they retired. So the concept of being an entrepreneur just never crossed my mind. When did that change? Was that a big point of change? Yes, huge. It changed, I guess, when I was in Japan. And I had reached a tipping point where I could not do the consulting work and the full-time work. And I realized I had to take a leap into the unknown. I didn't know if it would be successful to be an entrepreneur. And I had seen Jeff, who's my business partner, be an entrepreneur exclusively when he moved back to Seattle because he didn't take a full-time job. 
And every time we talked, he would say, Kim, quit your job. We've got work. We can work together. Quit your job. Quit your job. But that idea of quitting my job was so scary. Now that I've been doing it for three years, it's the best decision I ever made, but it's also the hardest decision I ever made because I had a great job. I loved my school. I loved my job. I loved Japan. I did not want to leave. But the idea of trying something new and working for myself was so exciting that I wanted to just give it a try. If for some reason this doesn't work out, I could always be a teacher again. Like I felt like I had a safety net. Biggest challenge for me is that I don't really know anything about being an entrepreneur. I don't know anything about running a business. I'm doing everything based on what feels right. What's my instinct? And then I got a mentor and that's been really helpful. So I have a mentor who has been in business for a long time. I come to him with issues and he helps me. And then he tells me like what he thinks my next step should be. So that's been really helpful. The other biggest challenge is going to be unique to our business. And that is that Jeff is based in Seattle and Chrissy is based in Perth and I am based in Bangkok. So thinking about time zones, it makes it really hard for us to have meetings because we're literally 15 hours apart. So trying to keep a business running when you almost never see the other person is really challenging. We are basically running a business through Google Hangouts. It's good to hear that more and more businesses are running their companies on the internet and you don't have to come to the office. Yeah, it's great for like the day-to-day being able to be productive and knowing that I have everything I need right in my house and I can choose kind of how I set up my day. But what we notice is that when we're physically together, we get so much more done we gel as a team when we're in physical space together. So there is something valuable about being together. And the fact that we only do that maybe once a year, I think means that our business isn't growing as fast as it could. And that's just for me, Chrissy and Jeff, who are the directors of the company. Then you realize the employees, they're totally by themselves in their home. You know, I've been an employee. I don't care as much about the company as the owner does. That's just the way it works. So those people now are really isolated and they don't have the big picture. So we're finding all these strategies to bring our team together on a regular basis where we can all celebrate our accomplishments and see how we're moving together towards a common goal, even though we might never see each other in person. From what I've seen as well, employees need to basically see the visionary to get inspired. Absolutely. And it's really weird when you have employees who need to do things together because this job and this job need to work together, but they never see each other. How does that work? You got to make use of tools like Slack and Google Hangouts. We use Google Docs a lot, like all the different tools in Google app. It's the social capital, the like building bonds between people that is the hard part to do in virtual space. And so now we're kind of putting this extra burden on them of figuring out how to operate in this digital space and be a collaborative team with people you never are physically with. Were there times where you thought of giving up or going back to a full-time job? Not yet. And I hope that that does not happen. You're the first person who is an entrepreneur that I interviewed that said that. Oh, really? (laughs) If I was a single person and I was trying to make it work, I might have thought of it because I might not have had enough money. But because my husband and I have both been through periods of time where I earn the money and he's not working for whatever reason, and then he earned the money and I'm not working, we balance it out. You know, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You have to be able to feed and clothe yourself and survive. So if I had ever been at that point, obviously I would have gone back to a full-time job. But because I had that cushion of my husband having a job too, it was never necessary. What kind of advice would you give to your younger self? I would say follow your instinct. I think that I did that. I don't think that I could have changed much. But if I was able to tell myself that that was the right thing, it might have even given me like more confidence. We learned through our experiences. I wouldn't trade any of the experiences I had, but knowing that they were the right experiences, I never knew. Like I never knew that studying abroad would help me be passionate about living overseas. You know, visiting my friend on a vacation would lead me to having that internship. I never knew that having that internship would lead me to realize that I loved working with kids. So being able to know that in retrospect would be really great. So follow your instincts, I think, is one thing. I think it's also you going out and experiencing the world to see what's possible and then identifying those opportunities as well. Yes. 
I think it very easily could have gone where I didn't do any of that because it was so scary. The idea of living in another country, just moving away from home and not knowing when I was going to come back, that was all really scary. And when I did that, when we left the United States in 2000, Skype was like barely a thing. The internet was just starting. Even communicating with people seemed so much harder. Like my mom had a special phone plan that allowed her to call Germany for a reasonable rate. Like all these things are so much easier now. But when I did it, it felt like impossible. So I just like keep going, I think is what I would have told myself. Do you have any books that you would recommend? So a couple of books that I think had a big impact on my life. One is by a teacher called Will Richardson. And his book is called Blogs, Wikis, Podcasts, and Other Powerful Web Tools for the Classroom. So this is back when these things were new. And reading that book made it so clear that I, as a teacher, am obligated to find a way to give an authentic voice to my students. And that book started my entire journey on all of my professional development. I created my own blog, and then I had my students blogging, and then I started using Twitter, and I started connecting and building a personal learning network. So that kind of changed my teaching trajectory. And then now I'm reading Good to Great by Jim Collins. And it's just about how companies can go from being just good to being great. And I think there's a lot of lessons in there that I can take out and apply to my own company, but also my own self. Another book that really kind of changed the way I think about technology is a book called The Long Tail by Chris Anderson. The idea behind the book is that concept of the long tail, like the most popular things, lots of people are interested in them. But even the most random thing way out at the end, somebody else is interested in that. That book made me realize that so many times we feel like what we have to say isn't interesting to other people. But because we're all connected, there's always going to be somebody out there who's just like you, who's thinking about the same things as you, who's interested in the same things as you, who wants to learn the same things as you. And it's just a matter of finding that person. Another book that is business related is called Crossing the Chasm. You know it. Mark recommended the same one. Yeah. And it's about the difference between early adopters and the middle group and then laggards and understanding that you can have those early adopters, but if you don't cross the chasm to the middle of the road people, your business is not going to be successful. Another book that I'm reading is called The Lean Startup. And the idea behind that is being able to pivot and understanding how to work with a minimum viable product and make a success out of something without putting in a ton of effort at the forefront because you just don't know what's going to be successful and what's not. That one's like Startup Bible 101. <laughs> yeah. And then other like favorite general resources. I love podcasts. So that's why I'm so happy to be here on your podcast. And some of the podcasts I really love are Reply All. That's a podcast about like technology and it's just fun, like quirky, interesting things about technology. Another one that kind of goes with our conversation today is called Note to Self. Their tagline is the tech podcast about being human. And it's great for parents or teachers or even students who struggle to balance the digital and physical world and all the overwhelmingness that's coming at us from all our kind of media interactions. Thank you so much, Kim, for coming on my podcast and hope to hear your podcast soon as well. Yay! I'll link all the information on pathfinderspodcast.com. The next episode, I have a friend coming for the interview who's a tech entrepreneur. And his background is really interesting that he studied neuroscience and computer science. And he's really interested in AI and building a truly intelligent robots. And now he's an entrepreneur trying to build his own tech company. Cool. Don't forget to subscribe so you can keep getting new episodes. And we are on so many other platforms, so you might be watching on YouTube, but the podcast also on iTunes and Google Play. So if you want to switch the type of content that you get, then you can check out all the links on the website. Thank you so much for listening. See you in the next episode. If you run a really bad business and you don't make any profit, yeah. then does it make you non-profit? No. <laughs> keep forgetting questions that they kept popping up <laughs> ah, i can't talk anymore on um, pathfinders what's my link <laughs> <laughs>